Welcome back to an introduction to oceanography from the textbook Essentials of Oceanography, the 8th edition, brought to you by Cengage Learning and written by Tom Garrison and Robert Ellis. We're now moving on to the lecture on plate tectonics. And plate tectonics really explains just about everything, not completely everything, but just about everything. And that's why plate tectonics is known as the grand unifying theory of geology. So you may wonder why you jump into geology so early in an oceanography course, but the bottom line is the geology of the earth really has mandated the ocean basins, where they were, where they are, and what they look like. So let's get into plate tectonics. So we'll start out with some basic concepts that we're going to study in this lecture. So the earth is 4.6 billion years old. The earth's interior is layered and layered by density, with each deeper layer being more dense than the layer above. The idea that continents are not supported above sea level by resting mechanically on a rigid base, but instead continents actually rest on a very de dense deformable layer beneath them, kind of in the same way that a boat is supported by water. One of the concepts, biggest concepts here is the brittle surface of the earth is fractured into a, about a dozen tile-like plates and the movement of material, that same material that the continents rest on, the movement of that material underneath the Earth's surface causes those plates to move around relative to one another. Continents and oceans are formed and destroyed where plates collide, flex, and sink. So the movement of those plates and how they hit each other and where they sink one under the other and where they crumple when they hit up against each other, that all creates the continents and the ocean basins. The centers of our lightweight continents, we find out, are very, very old, where the actual seafloor is very, very young, and we'll explain why that is the case. And we'll talk about the excellent evidence that shows us that the seafloor is, in fact, very young and is spreading apart at the centers of the seafloor. And we'll see that evidence with, uh, with the ages of the seafloor and the magnetic fields of the seafloor. All right, quick look at the age of the Earth. This is the history of the thinking that went into the age of the Earth. It was Leonardo da Vinci who first recognized that fossils represent evidence of previous life. And then Descartes saw that Earth was in three stages back in the 1600s. He knew it was molten once, then there was a crust, and then after the crust came the atmosphere and the ocean. Archbishop Usser in the 15 and 1600s decided to define the age of the Earth with a dogmatic approach. He used scripture, setting the date of creation at October 22nd, 4004 BC. That resulted in a very short arrow of time. All right, Nicholas Steno started to develop these basic principles of geology that explain to us how geologic features were formed uh, when they were formed. Those principles of superposition, original horizontality, and lateral continuity. And these principles created a much, much longer arrow of time. George Louis Futon in 1700s calculated the Earth by cooling balls of molten metal, and he set the age of the Earth at about 96,000 years. That was at odds with the Church, and so he had to publish his findings in Protestant England. Werner, not Wegener, Wegener is a different guy, but Werner Gottlieb was uh, an aristocrat in the 1700s and 1800s. He developed a school of Neptunism, which he said, all rocks precipitated from a receding world ocean full of ions and volcanoes. And those volcanoes are spontaneous combustion of subterranean coal. Therefore, rocks on continents are old, and in the oceans they are young. This theoretical approach actually became the ruling theory because he was the professor of mineralogy at, at, uh, at Freiburg University. So um, Werner became the, like, the leading thinker in the age of the Earth and how the Earth was formed with this concept of, uh, of Neptunism. Uh, Cuvier, in the 1700s and 1800s, uh, studied... A different limestone and developed a school of catastrophism in which periods of life were laid down, as we see in fossils, and then destroyed. Life was destroyed and then more life came about. And this periods of catastrophes followed by life was all controlled by, by God, of course. And the last catastrophe would have been Noah's flood, after which all life had become perfect, the present day man. And this very much pleased the church. They liked this. And this was um, the concept of Neptunism. It, it, I'm sorry, the catastrophism replaced the concept of Neptunism. Hutton, uh, in the 1700s, was overshadowed Werner and Cuvier as he understood that time was very big and very, very long, and there were gaps in time where erosion had occurred and redeposition of rocks happened. So 
he recognized those gaps in time as unconformities. He saw that heat was the mechanism of mountain building and that volcanoes were created by melting rock. He championed this concept of Plutonism in which he said there was no vestige of a beginning and no prospect of an end. The earth had no beginning and no prospect of an end. He recognized that earth was dynamic uh, and that internal heat was the source of energy. And he gave several principles of geology that allowed us to determine relative time. And then Charles Lyell in the 1800s took Hutton's ideas and he built upon them. He published principles of geology in 1830 and developed principles of inclusion and the school of uniformitarianism. Uh, and that conforms the basic principles and processes that are observed today, which is the present is a key to the past, meaning what we see happening today is very much very likely what had happened in the past. And of course, this school implies a very, very long arrow of time in the billions of years. In the 1800s, along came Lord Kelvin, and Lord Kelvin was the preeminent thinker on all things science. And he had a problem with Hutton's idea of no beginning uh, and no end. He wanted to calculate the age of the Earth, and he used molten rock to calculate it somewhere between 20 million and 400 million years of age. And then he used this dying fruit model that if you imagine uh, an apple that's fresh and ripe sitting on the table, and maybe you come back six weeks later, and it's kind of a crinkled up, much smaller thing. Well, the dying fruit model says the earth was nice and smooth and round, and then as it got older and older and older, it began to contract and crinkle, and that's where the mountains came from. Um, Boltwood, this guy, vindicated Hutton in 1907 when he calculated the age of the earth based on radioactive decay. So this is 1907. We first began to use radioactive decay, and he said it was between 400 million and 2.2 billion years old, and that supported uniformitarianism, uh, which ruled until about the 1960s when actualism uh, is popularized. So a little indication uh, there of radioactive decay where we take the uh, age of a rock or really anything but say a rock. When the rock is formed it has 100% of its radioactive isotopes and those radioactive isotopes uh, spontaneously change into stable isotopes, in this case uranium-238 changing into lead-208. And if you count the proportion of each, if you know the half-life of those isotopes, and we do know half-lives of isotopes, uh, then you can, uh, you can age a rock, and that's radio, uh, radioactive dating. So the uh, uh, actualism tells us the Earth is dynamic, evolving, non-iterative, and obeys simple physical laws. Processes and rates can change, meaning the processes and rates that were happening at the beginning of the Earth's history may not be exactly the same as they are now, but, the constraints, but, they're, uh, but not the constraints. So the constraints under which the processes work under, they're the same. So um, the present is not necessarily the key to the past, but the present is a result of the past. So actualism allows for some processes and rates to have changed or stopped in the past uh, and is not just doing the same thing over and over and over again. It means it's not, it's, it's not iterative. Um, perhaps the Earth is hotter or behaving differently in the past. So actualism implies a definite beginning and an end to the Earth. Alfred Wegener published his first book, The Origin of Continents and Oceans, back in 1950. Wegener was a meteorologist, um, but he got very interested in rocks and geology and the map of the globe. And he proposed his theory of continental drift, in which he cited the apparent fit of the continents and the alignment of matching features, such as fossils and mountain ranges, on either sides of continents and either sides of ocean basins to support his theory. So Wegener took the continents, he fit them together, and the way they fit looked like this Pangaea, or Pangaea, um, depending on how you want to pronounce it. And not only did he say the continents fit, but when you fit them together, he said there were features that, that matched on either sides of continents, like uh, fossils of plants and lizards down across South America and Africa, and of course the plants stretched all the way over into India and Antarctica and Australia, and then linear mountain ranges that matched up across North America and Eurasia. And so it's not only the fit of the continents, but also these matching features that gave rise to Wegener's continental drift theory. Now, um, the fit of the continents around the Atlantic at water depth of about 137 meters, 450 feet, as calculated by Sir Edward Bullard at the University of Cambridge in the early 1960s. This shows that fit of the continents. So he didn't use the continents as we see them. Moreover, he used the continental shelf. Um, and it really created a, a revolution looking at this. People really began to see where the continents may have one time uh, began to fit together. So 
Albert Wegener's explanation as to what the, me the mechanism driving continental drift was very flawed, the idea not, did not go away. So in 1907, Wegener proposed this idea, but the mechanism that he gave, the explanation for why it was happening, he didn't understand at all. He, saw, he thought the continents were literally moving through the uh, oceans, um, and he didn't have any real explanation of how that was happening. So his idea was largely discounted by the scientific community, but the idea of the notion never went away. So the biggest block to acceptance of continental drift was uh, geology's understanding of the interior of the Earth and geology's belief at the time that the mantle was rigid, all right? So density is a key concept for the understanding of the structure of the Earth and plate tectonics. We understand that the Earth is density stratified, and density is a measure of mass per unit volume. How much stuff is in an amount of volume? If you have the same amount of volume and you stuff a bunch more stuff into it, let's say like lead, a cube of lead and a cube of styrofoam have two very different weights. The cube of lead has much, much, significantly more atoms stuffed into that same volume than the cube of styrofoam, and so it's more dense. Density is expressed as grams per cubic centimeters, and water has a density of one gram per cubic centimeter. So this thinking that the mantle was rigid did not allow for an understanding of the actual movement of the continents. Once we began to understand the density components of the interior of the Earth, and how those different components worked, it, it began to support the concept of continental drift, but not in its original uh, proposed processes. All right, so the continent and oceanic crust, crust have a, a, a low density, 2.7 2.9 grams per centimeter. So the oceanic crust is a little bit more dense, continental crust is the least dense, the mantle is quite a bit more dense than either of the continental crust, and then the core is very, very dense. Earth is density stratif stratified, layers of density with each deeper layer being denser than the layer above. And importantly, the density increases abruptly change at specific depths, I meaning it's not a transition, it's an abrupt change, distinct interior layers. And you can see what they're made of, the continents, mainly made of granite. Uh, the oceanic crust is mainly made of basalt, a very dark uh, rock, um, a, a low silica rock. The mantle is mostly silicon, oxygen, iron, and magnesium, and the, and the denser, heavier metals, iron and nickel, at the core. All right, so how do we know this? Seismic waves generated by earthquakes give scientists some of the best evidence about the structure of the Earth. These low-frequency pulses of energy generated by earthquakes spread rapidly through the Earth in all directions and then return to the surface. Earthquake waves passing through a homogeneous planet, meaning a planet that's all the same, would not be reflected or refracted, bent. Those waves would follow nice straight linear paths, and like you see on the left. But in reality, these waves are reflected, and they're bent, and they bounce back. And so in a planet that becomes gradually denser, uh, the refraction of those waves will be bent along evenly curved paths, and which is what we see on and B, the right side. But that's not what happens either. The, these waves, they change abruptly, and they change abruptly because of this very unique um, stratification of the Earth, where uh, the mantle is dense, the core is denser, and the interior core is denser still. And one of the very, very unique aspects of, this, of the core that we learned from studying seismic waves is that the P waves, uh, part of the body waves of, from an earthquake, those are compressional waves, they can move through a liquid, just like a sound wave can move through liquid. But the other waves generated by an earthquake, these S waves, these side-to-side -side waves, they don't move through a liquid. And so when scientists listen for waves around the world, they found P waves traveling through, through the center of the, of the Earth. And you can see where the P waves are refracted by density changes and reflected a little bit. Uh, but they go throughout the Earth. But they had this big S wave shadow where S waves could not penetrate the liquid outer core. So we've never been to the core of the Earth, but this study of S waves tells us that there is a liquid outer core. And that liquid outer core literally moves around the solid inner core at a different rate. And that difference in speed of the liquid outer core is the reason why we have a magnetic field around the Earth. We're going to go over this a couple of times, but we know about the core of the Earth. We have a solid inner core, we have a liquid outer core. And then we know about the mantle of the Earth, which is really, really quite thick. Then we have to break the upper parts of the mantle 
and the crust into these two separate things, the asthenosphere and the lithosphere. So the asthenosphere essentially is the upper part of the mantle that is partially melted. Imagine candle wax, not hot liquid candle wax, but just warm candle wax that might be pliable and movable. Something maybe thicker and denser than silly putty, um, but just it can just be moved a little bit. That is the asthenosphere, that upper part of the mantle. Then you take the very, very top of the mantle and you combine that with the crust, whether it's oceanic crust or continental crust, and you get the lithosphere. And the lithosphere is cool and it's solid, it's rigid because it is at the very outside of the earth and it's cooled off. And so the lithosphere is made up of the very top layer of the mantle and continental or oceanic crust and it's rigid. And the lithosphere is what is broken up into plates. And it's the lithosphere that moves around on top of that plastic asthenosphere. All right, this is a different look at the Earth's inner physical structure. And in this look, it's a little bit of a larger illustration for you. Uh, and in this look, we're going to talk again about the difference between the lithosphere and the asthenosphere. So the lithosphere is made up of both the crust, in this case that's continent, that's oceanic crust, I apologize, that's oceanic crust and continental crust. So there's our continental crust, it's lighter, it's less dense, it's granitic. This is our, our oceanic crust, it's, it's heavier, it's denser, it's darker, it's basaltic. That is the crust, the thin outer layer of the earth, the crust that we all think of when we talk about crust, mantle, and core. Well the lithosphere is a combination of the crust and the very upper part of the mantle. That is the lithosphere. This is the lithosphere, and it is solid. And it is a combination of both the crust, whether oceanic or continental, and the upper part of the mantle, and it is solid. And, and it is the lithosphere, it is the lithosphere, that, that combination of both upper mantle and crust, whether it's oceanic or continental, it is the lithosphere that makes up our tectonic plates. Underneath the lithosphere, the next part of the mantle is the athenosphere. And the athenosphere is weaker, hotter, and deeper into the mantle. And the boundary between those two, the lithosphere and the athenosphere, is defined by the way each area responds to stress. So this is the boundary. And this is the boundary upon which our plates ride, our tectonic plates ride. So this entire thing here on both sides, that could be one plate. Let's just say that's the North American plate. And that North American plate may be moving in this direction. And it's moving over and along this boundary between the asthenosphere and the lithosphere. That is where the plate boundary is, is actually moving. So the boundary between the lithosphere and the underlying asthenosphere is defined by a difference in response to stress. The lithosphere remains rigid for very long periods of geologic time in which it deforms elastically and through brittle failure. So that's earthquakes, essentially. While the asthenosphere deforms viscously and accommodates strain through plastic deformation. So the difference in stress. So what this is telling you is these two layers, whether it's the... the uh, the lithosphere or the asthenosphere, these two layers simply respond to stress differently, where the lithosphere responds by some elasticity, maybe the rock pulls and pulls and pulls, and then finally fails by snapping back into position, a brittle failure, where the asthenosphere deforms viscously like a very, very, very thick liquid. It's pliable, it moves, it accommodates strain to what's known as plastic deformation. So the thin oceanic crust is primarily basalt or basaltic rock, a heavy dark colored rock. The thicker continental crust is a granite, a speckled rock. So the continent is uh, lighter than the, uh, the oceanic crust. The continent is less dense. And the mantle itself consists of mainly oxygen, iron, magnesium, and silicon. Uh, the outer and inner core consist of mainly iron and nickel. So one more look at the Earth's internal physical structure, this from a different source, a slightly different uh, illustration here. And again, we have the very upper part of the mantle. This is this whole section here. So the lithosphere, 
part of the lithosphere is part of the upper part of the mantle. The, the thenosphere is sandwiched between what is typically known as a mantle and what is a lithosphere, and then there's the normal uh, upper mantle there. So the upper part of the mantle goes from the core mantle boundary deep in the earth all the way up to right where it touches the crust. But the crust itself is, is part of this other term, this lithosphere. So the crust and the very upper part of the mantle make up the lithosphere. And the big difference again is that when we look at the way the two different layers respond to stress, the lithosphere here, the lithosphere is rigid. And the asthenosphere here is plastic. And that allows the lithosphere to literally move this entire, this entire section here to literally move one way or the other over that plastic asthenosphere, right at that boundary there. The, the difference between those two, that, that boundary, this is going to move back and forth. And in the last image, I talked about the continental crust and the oceanic crust very likely being on the same plate. Looking at the way this is drawn, I'm going to make some assumptions just based on the way it's drawn that these are two separate plates, meaning we have an oceanic plate, which is the oceanic crust and its lithosphere, and a continental plate, which is the continental crust and its lithosphere. And the reason why I, I'm saying that is because I can see where this oceanic plate is, is going underneath the continental. So very likely what we have happening is our oceanic plate is moving in this direction and is being subducted underneath our continental plate. And that's all part of the plate tectonics, that one can be subducted under the other. And that's only because the oceanic is more dense and the continental is less dense. So in this situation, we very likely have continental lithosphere overriding oceanic lithosphere. Two separate plates, the continental plate and the oceanic plate, and this is a convergent plate boundary where one's overriding the other. So the lithosphere is the layer that includes the crust and the uppermost portion of the mantle. This layer has the ability to glide over the rest of the athenosphere. It can be regarded as the outer surface. That's the lithosphere. It's the outer surface. It's the crust and the uppermost portion of the mantle. The lithosphere is also the zone of earthquakes, mountain building, volcanoes, and plate tectonics. Below the lithosphere, the hot, partially melted layer of the upper mantle is called the asthenosphere. This layer has the physical properties that are different from the rest of the upper mantle. The rocks in this portion of the mantle are ductile and plastic, allowing the lithosphere to slide over it, resulting in plate tectonics. The asthenosphere is kept pliable by the internal heat of the earth. So where does the internal heat of the earth come from? Well, partially it comes from the cooling earth from 4.6 billion years ago, but largely the heat that's being generated in the core of the earth comes from radioactive elements. The radioactive decay maintain, maintains the heat source inside the earth. Radioactive decay is one unstable forms of elements. They don't have the right number of protons and neutrons in, the, um, uh, in their nucleus. Makes them unstable when they transform into stable elements. And that transformation releases radioactive energy. It releases heat. Heat is transferred within the earth by conduction, which is molecule to molecule, one molecule gets hotter and it causes the molecule next to it to get hotter, and convection. And convection is when material heats up through conduction, it expands because it's hotter. And because it expands, it takes up more volume. Because it takes up more volume, it has lower density, and lower density causes it to, uh, to be buoyant and float up. So conduction is heat transfer from one molecule in contact with another. Convection is the mass transport of heat, where again, a whole big blobs of, uh, of heat move up because uh, they become hotter and less dense. This heat results in the construction of mountains and volcanoes, earthquakes, movement of continents, and shapes of the ocean basins. All right, so why doesn't the lithosphere sink into the asthenosphere? How come it just doesn't sink and get swallowed up? Maybe like a, 
like a, a rock would get, sink into a lake and just be swallowed up. Um, how are ma things like mountains, very tall, massive, massive mountains, think about the Himalayas, these massive mountain range, how is it supported on uh, that uh, asthenosphere? Why does it just sink into the asthenosphere and be submerged into the mantle? Well, the Earth's continental crust and lithosphere, and really, of course, the continental crust is part of the lithosphere, so the Earth's continental lithosphere are supported on the denser asthenosphere. So the asthenosphere underneath the lithosphere is just denser. Um, we don't use the term buoyancy like we would with a boat. We, we use a term isostatic equilibrium, which describes the way the lithosphere is supported on the asthenosphere. But it's very much like, like the boat. You know, the container ship is uh, more dense um, uh, it, you know, a, a piece of metal is more dense than water, but because that container ship displaces water, meaning the, the bulk of that hull settling down into the water displaces the amount of water that's actually heavier than the ship itself, it causes the water to be, the ship to be buoyant. It's the same way as a iceberg is buoyant. But what you notice with a container ship is empty, it's at its water line. If you load it down, it begins to sink, and so more and more of the ship is underwater. And it's the same thing with an iceberg. The very, very large iceberg, most of it is underwater because as it's gotten larger and larger and larger, it sinks deeper into the water. If you were to take that iceberg and start chopping off pieces of it at the top and make it smaller and smaller and smaller, like the iceberg to the right, the whole thing, even as the iceberg above the surface got lower, because you were chopping chunks of it off, the whole iceberg would begin to float up, and so the relative elevation above the surface wouldn't change dramatically. So Earth's continental crust and lithosphere, again, the crust is part of the lithosphere, are supported on the denser asthenosphere by isostatic equilibrium. The concept of buoyancy is illustrated by a ship on the ocean. The ship sinks until it displaces a volume of water equal to the weight of the ship and its cargo. An iceberg also sinks into water so that the same proportion of the volume, about 90%, is submerged. The more mass of the iceberg, the greater this volume is, the greater the amount of volume that it has to displace, so the deeper it goes. So it's, it's not dissimilar with a mountain. Um, both oceanic and continental crusts are supported through this type of buoyancy, this, this isostatic rebound. In the case of this very, very large mountain, since it's got this massive mountain with this massive root, root it settles deeper into the asthenosphere than the oceanic crust does. And that's why we have these images here where you can see that the continental crust here is settled deeper into the asthenosphere and the continental crust here has settled deeper into the asthenosphere. And, and one last time at a smaller scale, but there, the continental crust has settled deeper, it's it caused that indention in the asthenosphere. And that's what happens with mountains. There's, there's isostatic equilibrium, where the amount that the mountain weighs is equal to the amount of mantle that that mountain root has displaced. So if you just, if you just to, to imagine that mountain root, uh, let me rephrase that, Ima imagine this continental crust going straight across like, like it does everywhere else, and then you start piling on material. Maybe you pile it on through um, a deposition of sediment, and you start piling it on. As you pile it on, it's going to begin to settle deeper and deeper and deeper into the asthenosphere. And so this mountain that was built by tectonic forces, if it didn't sink into the asthenosphere, it would be significantly higher above the ocean. It'd be, it'd be this distance higher above the ocean. But because of isostatic rebound, it settles into the asthenosphere. But what's interesting about that is if I began to erode material off this mountain, just weathering causes material to begin to erode and would start taking material off, as the weight of this mountain becomes less and less and less, it's going to displace less and less mantle, and the entire thing will rise up. And so that's also part of isostatic rebound, that as you pile material on, the root settles down into the mantle. And then as you take material off, 
the whole mountain rises up. So even as you erode mountains away, they rise up out of the mantle. And, and what that means is the erosion of, man, of uh, mountains is a very, very, very slow process. And, and that's just sort of the bottom line to that. All right. Isostatic erosion and isostatic readjustment can cause continental crust to become thinner uh, and mountainous regions. So there you have your very thick mountain, all right? Uh, and then as the mountain is eroded, you get that uplift so that continental crust becomes uh, thinner there. You can see how thick it is. It's, 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 it's this thick in the beginning. And then as erosion begins to occur, it becomes thinner, but this uplift means the actual height of the mountain above the sea level does not drop significantly. It drops a little bit, it drops slowly, but not significantly. And then look at this. As you begin to deposit this sediment on either side of the mountain, then you begin to cause that to sink down uh, into, the, uh, into the mantle. So you get uplift here of that part of the continent and um, down, uh, downward motion here. That's your isostatic rebound. So further erosion exposes rocks that were once embedded deep within the peaks. Uh, deposition of sediment away from the mountain often, often causes that crust to sink. So how do you get these rocks that were, were in the middle of the mountain exposed a million years later? Well, this, this concept of weathering, erosion, and transportation exposes those rocks. And yeah, because there's less material taking up space in the mantle, that whole thing begins to rise up. And so the mountain erodes away very, very slowly. All right, so Alfred Wegener, our meteorologist, had this theory of continental drift. Um, it was out of favor with the scientific community until we had new technology that provided real evidence to support his ideas. Seismographs revealed the pattern of volcanoes and earthquakes around the Pacific known as the Ring of Fire. And it also, seismographs, began to show um, these uh, volcanoes and earthquakes, well, volcanoes specifically, and, and earthquakes with the seismographs along the ocean ridges. Radiometric dating of rocks revealed that, that very young rocks existed along the, uh, in the oceanic crust along the ridges, and that very old rock, 200 million years old or, or, old, or about that age, was along the continental margins. What that told us was that the young rock was being created at the mid-ocean ridge and getting older as it moved away from the ridge. But it was also surprising that this, this oceanic crust was so much younger than the continental crust. Echo sounders revealed the shape of the mid-Atlantic ridge, so echo sounders and ships showed us that that mid-Atlantic ridge existed. Ocean floor sediments were found to be thickest and oldest at the edge of the ocean, those continental margins, and thinnest and youngest at the mid-ocean ridge. Again, the the oceanic crust that was being created at the oceanic ridge was the youngest. The plastic nature of the upper mantle, the eosinosphere, was being revealed by seismic studies. We are beginning to understand that the eosinosphere existed. And so these were kind of all unrelated discoveries, but they helped to develop this theory, the theory of seafloor sea spreading. So the theory of seafloor spreading simply tells us that in the mantle, hot magma, this is the convection, the mass transport of magma. Magma flows up, all right? Magma flows up, and what can be magma plumes? And, and it most often happens in oceanic crust, but this exact same thing can happen under continents. Continents can be split apart too. As a matter of fact, East Africa is being split apart. The East African rift zone is occurring because there's hot magma pushing up. But we're going to use this oceanic crust uh, example. So, there is a magma plume, basically hot magma rising up literally from the core mantle boundary. And it pushes, literally pushes up because it's, it's hot and less dense. And so it splits the oceanic crust and, and pushes it up. And gravity causes that part of the oceanic crust to move in that direction and this part to move in that direction. And this is the mid-ocean rise. And they're significant. And so not only is there a significant difference in the seafloor, the level of the seafloor, but this is where you have volcanoes and even some earthquakes. And then as that crust moves out towards a continent, it is then subducted under the continent, and that subduction of that crust causes some melting, and the melting causes magma to rise up here and create volcanoes, and we see that on both sides. So plate movement is powered by convection currents in the asthenosphere. Mid-ocean ridges are spreading ridges and the source for new ocean floor rising up out of the upper mantle. So this magma coming up creates the new ocean floor. And the magma 
has very little silicon because it's coming down from deep in, in, the, uh, in the asthenosphere. So this rock that it creates is a low silica, very, very dark rock. New ocean crust moves away from the mid-ocean ridge as it cools, becoming more dense and sinking, and that's why the ocean floor dips back down, making the ocean deeper away from the mid-ocean ridge. Oceanic crust sinks, subducts, along the continental margins, effectively recycling the crust and the mantle. So this is a big recycling center. It comes up here as hot magma, it cools and solidifies and sinks, and then it subducts underneath the, uh, the continents, where eventually down here it's melted again. Gravity pulls the plate, as I told you, off the ridge at the mid-ocean ridge and into the mantle at the subduction zones. So here's a cutaway showing the internal structure of the Earth. Uh, and we have a couple of different things happening here. We have three plates that you can see here. On the left, there is an oceanic lithospheric plate composed of oceanic crust and, and lithosphere underneath it, um, the mantle underneath it, the rigid mantle underneath it. Then to the right, the middle, is going to be another oceanic lithospheric plate composed of the oceanic crust attached to the upper mantle, and that creates a second lithospheric plate. And then there's a continental lithospheric plate. The convection current in the magma creates rising magma that lifts up the lithospheric oceanic plates, causes them to split, and creates the mid-ocean ridge, where gravity causes those lith lithospheric plates to slide away from the spreading center. And then at the continental lithospheric plate, the colder, more dense oceanic lithospheric plate sinks and subducts underneath the continental oceanic plate. And it, uh, it, it continues to pull that oceanic lithospheric plate away from the spreading center, the mid-oceanic ridge. The ideas of continental drift and seafloor spreading were tied together in the theory of plate tectonics. The main points of the theory of plate tectonics, that the Earth's outer layer is divided into lithospheric plates that Earth's plates float on the asthenosphere, that plate movement is powered by convection currents in the asthenosphere resulting in seafloor spreading, plates sliding off the raised ridges of seafloor spreading centers, and the downward pull of descending plates leading edge back into the mantle. Plate tectonics became the grand unifying theory for many disciplines of geography. Ultimate confirmation came from research in what's known as paleomagnetism, or looking at the magnetic fields of the Earth's of the Earth uh, as it was locked up uh, in, uh, in rock that formed at those spreading centers. If the Earth's heat is produced from cooling from its molten stage, then that heat should have dissipated by now. In reality, most of the Earth's heat is generated by radioactive decay given off in the nuclei of an unstable element break apart in the upper mantle and crust. Heat travels to the surface by conduction and convection. This drives plate tectonics as heat from within the Earth keeps the athenosphere flowing as well as keeping the lithosphere moving. The tectonic system is powered by heat. Some parts of the mantle are warmer than others and convection currents form where warm mantle material rises and cool material falls. Above the mantle floats the cool rigid lithospheric plates and that lithosphere is fragmented into those plates. Plate movement is powered by gravity. The plates slide down the ridges at the places of their formation. Their dense, cool leading edges are then pulled back into the mantle. Most of this tectonic activity occurs at plate boundaries. Evidence of this tectonic plate boundaries came in the a worldwide mapping of seismic events. This is January 77 through December of 1986, and the location of about 10,000 earthquakes colored in red, green, and blue based on their depth. And we can see very clear patterns that develop, and these earthquake patterns essentially line the outer edges of lithospheric plates. So further evidence of tectonics at plate boundaries. Remember, Wegener's original theory could not provide an adequate explanation for what drove the movement of the continents. He thought the continents literally moved through the oceanic crust. But as we began to map the ocean floor, and we saw that there were significant ridges in the middle of oceans, and then we began to study the rocks along and away from those ridges, more evidence uh, came to light, such as the ages of rocks. There's a very distinctive pattern uh, showing seafloor spreading over the last 200 million years. Very, very young rocks exist along the mid-ocean ridges, and the further you get away from those mid-ocean ridges in a very symmetrical pattern, 
we see older and older rocks. And what's most notable is the ocean, the oceanic crust, the seafloor rocks, are only about 200 million years old, where continental rocks are much older. One other piece of evidence was this idea of polar wandering. Uh, when, for many, many years, geologists looked at the magnetic properties in some rocks, they saw those magnetic fields aligned in many different ways, indicating that perhaps the magnetic poles had wandered or moved. But if you bring continental movement into this, you bring plate tectonic, tectonics into this, we can see that the magnetic fields of all the rocks in Africa, North America, South America, Eurasia, they all align to a single point if you bring the continents all back to one major landmass 220, 250 million years ago, uh, that would be Pangaea. So the magnetic properties of all those continents suggest the North Pole had apparently migrated, but you can solve that problem if you leave the pole fixed where it is, at the north, and you move the continents. And that's one other piece of evidence of plate tectonics. The final straw that broke the camel's back that made the theory of plate tectonics be widely accepted and become a unifying theory of geology was paleomagnetism. And paleomagnetism is the fact that over great geologic spans of time, the magnetic field of the Earth has switched from uh, positive to negative, being at opposite poles. And you can see that in the rock record. The normal polarity, where we are now, of the magnetic poles is represented with strong magnetism in the rocks as they form. And then the reverse polarity is in weaker magnetism. And just like there's a very symmetric pattern of younger to older rocks along the seafloor, we also find a very symmetric pattern that spread from the seafloor. So paleomagnetism, strips of altering magnetic polarity at spreading ridges. The patterns of paleomagnetism support plate tectonic theory. The molten rocks at the spreading centers take on the polarity of the planet while they are cooling. When the Earth's polarity reverses, the polarity of newly formed rock changes. So when scientists conducted a magnetic survey of a spreading center, they found bands of weaker and stronger magnetic fields frozen in the rock. The molten rocks forming at the center of the spreading ridge take on the polarity of the planet when they are cooling and then move slowly in both directions from the center. When the Earth's magnetic fields reverse, the polarity of newly formed rock changes, creating a symmetrical bands of opposite polarity. And these symmetrical bands of polarity were really the final piece of evidence that confirmed the theory of plate tectonics. And here's a map of the major lithospheric plates showing the direction of the relative movement and the location of the principal hotspots. Now the hotspots, like under Hawaii, are locations where magma plumes bubble up from the mantle core boundary in a spot. The magma is bubbling up in these ridges, in the mid-ocean ridges, but there are some places where it just comes up in just one location, and those hot spots allow the formation of Pacific island chains, like Hawaii. Most of the million or so earthquakes and volcanic events each year, that's how many, occur along these plate boundaries. And the little triangles indicate where plates are moving, where there's a subduction zone or where plates are converging upon one another. Uh, and then we also have diverging plate boundaries, uh, and that's what we see with the, um, uh, in the mid-ocean ridge, the mid-Atlantic ridge, or the, Pacific, the East Pacific ridge. Uh, and we also have boundaries that slide by each other, we see in these, uh, in these oranges. Those are transform uh, boundaries. Again, the major lithospheric plates showing their directions and relative movement and the location of those principal hotspots. So you can see that there is a plate, an oceanic Nazca plate is subducting under the South American plate. And it's important to understand that while this entire plate is nothing but oceanic crust. The South American plate, composed of continental crust of South America and the oceanic crust of the western parts of the Atlantic Ocean. The same thing with the North American plate. There's all of North America that makes up that plate, but it's also part of, also com is comprised of oceanic crust as well. So in some cases, a plate is all oceanic, like in the Pacific, in this location, but in other cases, the plate is a combination of, of uh, oceanic, like in the Indian-Australian plate, uh, where it's moving north. Part of it is the Australian subcontinent, part of it is the Indian subcontinent, part of it is the oceanic crust here. Interesting to note, this is the location where two continental um, lithospheric plates collide, and one doesn't subduct under the other, they just kind of crumple, and because they're crumpling, you get this uplift and you get this tremendous um, plateau that has been created, the, plate, the Tibetan Plateau, 
in the Himalaya Mountains. That's where two continental plates converge. And then I, I mentioned earlier in the lecture, uh, those plumes can make continents spread apart as well. And this is the East African Rift Zone, where uh, the Red Sea was once, these, were, these two pieces of continental crust were closed together, but a plume up underneath them is pushing them apart. And, and that's how we think Pangaea ultimately broke up. A large magma plume developed underneath the continent of Pangaea and caused it to begin to split apart as different sections of the continent slid away from themselves. All right, so here are your plate boundaries in action. So there's your globe, three plates, A, B, and C. And as we put them into motion, we can see the different types of plate boundaries. Um, and so as plate A moves to the left, to the west, a gap behind it forms at one. So that is a diverging boundary. That's where two plates are moving away from one another, like at a mid-ocean ridge. Okay, Sliding along the top and the bottom uh, creates those transform boundaries. So you have a sliding transform boundary where plates slide by each other. That's much like the San Andreas Fault. And then at, at two, where plate A is now having to slide under plate B, you have an overlap or a convergent plate boundary. So those are our three basic types of plate boundaries, divergent, transform, and convergent. So here is your rising magma plume, all right, created by a convection current in the mantle. It causes this, this spreading ridge to form where plates are moving to the force of gravity away from the ridge that has built up and they're sliding away. And so there is your divergent boundary right there. As plates slide away from each other, they, they break and you create these transform boundaries where there's a divergent boundary here where plates are moving like this and like this. And so this plate's moving in this direction this plate's moving in this direction, and this line at three is a transform boundary where the two plates are sliding by each other. And then the third type is where this plate is subducting underneath a continental plate. This oceanic plate is more dense, it's heavier, so at this convergent boundary, there's subduction. So the convergent boundary is a destructive zone. Oceanic plate is being destroyed, and at the diverging boundary, oceanic plate is being created. A divergent boundary, it's constructive. And at a transform boundary, it's conservative. It's neither being uh, created or being destroyed. So the mid-ocean ridge is a series of broken divergent boundaries. And between each broken divergent boundary, we have transform boundaries. The Nazca plate is a convergent boundary where the Nazca plate is subducting, converging and subducting under the South American plate. And then another transform boundary is between the Pacific plate and the North American plate. And that's what creates the San Andreas Fault, which also happens to be a transform boundary. So at divergent boundaries, where boundaries pull apart, you create what are known as normal faults. So divergent plate boundaries, boundaries between plates that are moving apart. You can have a divergent boundary in oceanic crust, like the Mid-Atlantic Mid Ridge, or a divergent boundary in continental crust, like the East African Rift Valley. Where they pull apart, you get this drop down. And so the Mid-Ocean Ridge is where the magma plume, let me just, the mid-ocean ridge is where the magma plume has pushed this all up, and then as the boundaries are sliding away from each other, this middle section drops down. And so the mid-ocean ridge, right across the ridge itself, looks something like that, where there's a ridge that goes up, but right in the middle there's this, this area where you've seen this normal fault where these, where these chunks have dropped down. The same thing goes if it's continental crust. The continental crust slides away from itself and creates what's called these normal faults or those rifts in the East African rift zone. When boundaries converge, you get these, these types of faults, these reverse faults. So there's pressure with boundaries, two boundaries converging. At first you get some deformation, some, some movement of the rock, but eventually it snaps 
and this reverse fault occurs where one lifts up over the other. And again, if we think about where the Australian Indian plate has run into the Eurasian plate, this is the Australian Indian plate, and it's crumpled up creating the Himalaya Mountains. And that's where two continent plates have converged upon uh, one another. In the case of oceanic converging on a continental plate, because the oceanic is more dense, it just subducts underneath the continental plate. And of course, the transform boundary where the two plates shear or slide by one another. And again, this is uh, what you see in the San Andreas Fault in California. So there's your divergent boundary. It starts with your rising magma plume. And the little rift zone forms as these two pieces of crust slide down that ridge. Your rift valley is created. A lot of uh, volcanism happening in that rift valley. And then eventually it, uh, it grows into an inland sea. And eventually as it gets wider and wider and wider, it actually becomes an ocean. So divergent boundaries where plates are moving apart it can be divergent oceanic crust and divergent continental crust. As the lithosphere begins to crack, a rift form beneath the continent and molten basalt from the asthenosphere begins to rise. As the rift continues to open, two new continents were being separated by a growing ocean basin. Um, volcanoes and earthquakes occur along the active rift, which is the mid-ocean ridge. Now the East African Rift Valley currently resembles this stage. The East African Rift Valley currently resembles this B stage. And then as the new oceanic basin forms, uh, this is, uh, becomes the Atlantic Ocean. So again, here's your divergent boundary. The mid-ocean ridge is the divergent boundary, and there's several sections of it. It's not a continuous thing. They're broken up into, into several sections. And again, between those sections is the transform boundary. So seafloor spreading was an idea that was proposed in 1960 to explain the features of the seafloor. How did they explain this mid-ocean ridge and the abyssal plain between the continents and the mid-ocean ridge? Where did that mid-ocean ridge come from? Well, seafloor seafloor spreading was the theory that was proposed to explain it. It explained the development of the seafloor at the mid-Atlantic ridge. Convection currents in the mantle were proposed as the force that caused the ocean to grow and the continents to move. The mid-Atlantic ridge showing its conformance to the coastline of the adjacent continents, meaning when we look at the mid-Atlantic ridge, it conforms to the coastlines as these continents have all spread apart. So these continents all at one time were stuck together but they began to spread apart as a magma plume developed underneath it and caused each side of the continents to move away. And Iceland is simply a spot where the mid-ocean ridge has grown high enough that it's, it's come above the, the actual seafloor. So the breakup of Pangaea began about 225 million years ago. Again, some plume of magma welled up underneath the continent and caused it all to begin to slide apart until we got to our current configuration. And where those continents were together at one time, eventually, if you follow the zoo, that's where our mid-ocean ridges have formed and where they, they, they developed and they continued this day. So here's a more detailed look at a convergent boundary. Convergent plate boundaries can be oceanic converging with continental or oceanic converging with oceanic or continental converging with continental. Where oceanic converges with continental. A good example is the west coast of South America. And when we see the Nazca plate subducting under the South American plate, as that plate subducts down, the heating of this plate and other uh, and pressure cause volatile chemicals and, and water really to come out of the plate. And that causes a lot of melting in this mantle wedge. And that mantle bubbling up creates mountains. And that's where the very young Andes Mountains come from, right along the coastline of Peru and Chile, is that magma that wells up from this mantle wedge from the subducting plate. And the motion down actually creates a trench. So where plates subduct under one another, you also get these trenches. Now, a lot of the Peruvian Chile uh, trench is full of sediment, but out in the deep ocean, we have massive trenches. But all locations where you have plate subduction, you get A, trenches, and then away from the plate boundary itself, which is right here, you get this mountain building. Oceanic crust that, that converges with other oceanic crust occurs in the North Pacific. You get these deep, deep, deep trenches in the ocean, but you also get island chains that develop. Um, and we see that with some of the archipelagos in the, uh, in the Pacific Ocean. And then where continental crust converges with the continental crust, the continents just sort of crumple, and that's where you get the Himalayas. So 
cross-section to the west coast of South America showing the convergence of a continental plate and an oceanic plate. The subducting oceanic plate becomes more dense as it descends. Its downward slide is propelled by gravity. At a depth of about 50 miles, heat drives water and other volatile components from the subducted sediments in the, into the overlying mantle, lowering that mantle's melting point and masses of melted material rich in water and carbon dioxide then rise, and in this case, they form the Andes Mountains. And this is where two continental crusts have converged. They're both about the same density, so one won't really subduct under the other. Now, before the continental crust did converge, there was an oceanic crust sub subducting underneath this continent, and then the two continents smashed into each other. So this subduction represents where it was an oceanic crust prior, but when continent hits continent, they just crumple. And not only do you get the, the crumpled Himalaya mountains, but you also get this whole uplift of the Tibetan Plateau behind it. So this is the cross-section through southern China, so in the convergence of two continental plates. Neither plate is dense enough to subduct. Instead, their compression and folding uplift the plate edges to form the Himalayas. So there is this massive root that goes down into the Athenosphere. That's the root of the mountain that supports those, those Himalayan mountains. Um, high up above sea level. And again, what that looked like, the uh, Asian, I should say the Indian-Australian plate, and it literally ran into the Eurasian plate. So at one time, there was water between these two plates, and that's where this subduction zone came from, where there was oceanic crust between the two plates. The oceanic crust was, was subducting underneath the, uh, the uh, Eurasian plate. But once that gap closed, it just became continent, smashing in a continent and just folding in uplift. And this whole thing is that mountain root that supports the very high Himalayas. And as the Himalayas erode, and they do erode a great deal, they'll erode away and get shorter and shorter. But as they erode away, this root then displaces less mantle and the whole thing rises up. And that is that isostatic rebound. Now, eventually the Himalayas can erode flat, but it gives you an idea of why, why mountains are such long-lived features on Earth. Because as they erode, uplift occurs, and, and uh, they, they, it just takes a very long time for them to go away. So there you have your continental, continental convergence. So now let's take a look at convergent boundaries between oceanic and oceanic. So two oceanic lithospheric plates are going to collide together. This plate on the left is moving toward this plate on the right. And the reason why the plate on the right subducts under the plate on the left is because this plate is older. Because it's older, it is colder. Because it's, because it's colder, it is more dense. And so this oceanic crust, the blue here, and the upper mantle as part of the lithosphere, these two combined making the lithosphere, will subduct under this oceanic lithosphere. This oceanic plate is moving in this direction. As the colder, older, and more dense plate subducts underneath the younger, less dense plate, once again, liquids and volatiles and water and carbon dioxide are forced out of the plate at depth, creating magma that bubbles up on the seafloor to create a chain of volca volcanoes, much like you see with the islands of Japan. And some of the features are the, the, the fore arc, which is going to be the actual island chain itself, this marginal sea that develops behind it, and a trench that's going to develop right here out ahead of those, of those uh, islands. And those trenches are a very key component of, con of oceanic and oceanic plate convergence. And so we see that just about anywhere that we see uh, two oceanic plates converge, or even an oceanic plate converge under a, uh, a continental plate. So as one plate converged under the other, and in this case, the, uh, our, our plate is, is subducting this plate is moving in this direction, this plate's moving in this direction, so this is the subducting plate here. And as it subducts down, it creates a line of shallow, and then deeper, and then deeper still earthquakes. And that is a big part of uh, the subduction of plates, is the fact that they create these shallow earthquakes, uh, initially as they begin their subduction, and as the plate subducts deeper and deeper and deeper, the earthquakes get deeper and deeper as well. All right, we'll talk a little bit about transform boundaries. Transform boundaries or transform faults form because the axis of the seafloor spreading on the surface of the sphere cannot follow a straight line, meaning the seafloor is spreading on this sphere, but because it's a sphere, it can't follow a perfectly straight line, so they get split apart at different levels, north and south. A long transform plate boundary, which includes California's San Andreas Fault, is uh, right here. So we have, this is the boundary, this is the long transform plate boundary right here, where the Pacific Plate 
and the North American plate are literally sliding by each, one, each other. So a transform plate boundary is where two plates are uh, sliding by one another. The other concept is this idea of a magma plume, not creating a mid-ocean ridge, but just a spot where the uh, ocean plate is lifted up. A mantle plume is a column of superheated mantle that originates at the boundary between the core and the mantle. Formation of a volcanic island chain as an oceanic plate moves over a stationary mantle plume and hotspot. In this example, the formation of the Hawaiian Islands and Lohi uh, is a newly forming island just off the, uh, the Big Island coastline. So, so here's the deal. The mantle plume and the hot spot are stationary. They don't move. But this lithospheric plate is moving along. That, that um, Pacific plate is moving along, and it's moving along off to the north and west. So first, 3.8 to 5.6 million years ago, the mantle plume and hot spot formed the island of Kauai. And then it may have settled down for a brief period of time, and the plate moved along to the north and west. When the mantle plume got hot again, it created the island of Oahu, and then moved along, and then as it got hot again, Molokai and Maui. And really, just over the last half to three quarters of a million years, the big island of Hawaii has been formed, and now in about 30 years, this new seamount that's underwater will break the surface, uh, and we'll see that new island form. So hot spots also create these island chains. And this entire line of, uh, of islands is part of the Hawaiian island chain. And we can see here that at, at this point, the Pacific plate was moving due north, and then it began a change in its direction, which is what caused the change of that island. Now, this arc of islands, the Aleutian Islands, that is where the Pacific plate is subducting under the North American plate, and it's creating that arc of islands like we saw with Japan. So, the other thing that happens with uh, convergent plate boundaries is things like islands may be sliding along with that oceanic plate. And if the oceanic plate is sliding along and there's a seamount or some type of oceanic ridge or island chain, and that whole plate slides along and subducts underneath a continent, well, that, that chunk of the surface that rises above the sea surface is literally just going to get scraped off and stuck to that continent. Uh, and these are known as terrains. And terrains move along with the oceanic plate until they run into some other continental crust. And at that point, they are literally just uh, scraped off and sutured, stuck to the continent. And uh, these terrains um, are basically help the continent grow. A, a big part of the western part of the United States, west of the Rockies, is a combination of terrains that have been scraped off on the North American plate. And uh, you can see that here with these different island arcs and submarine deposits and ancient seafloor and continental fragments that were all stuck on the west coast of North America. All right, lastly, we're gonna talk about the, uh, the, the Wilson cycle. The Wilson cycle is the concept of the, uh, the formation of uh, an ocean by the rifting of a continent and then ultimately the closing of that ocean as we go through one extraordinarily long uh, cycle from a rifting in stage one to a juvenile uh, inland sea to a mature diverging spreading plate with a mid-ocean ridge and, and then as two continents begin to grow closer and closer together what was a mature ocean getting narrower and narrower and then that gap between them closing and then the suturing so th this is what's happening between Africa and South America uh, and Africa, North Africa, and North America, maybe the Eurasian continent, the Euro European continent in North America. The, the two are spreading apart, spreading away from each other, and the mid-ocean ridge is the result. This is what happened with Eurasia and, and the Indian continent. Um, they were coming toward each other, the water between them got closer and closer and closer, and eventually the two continental plates collided and created the Himalayan mountains. So plate tectonics is a very important part of um, of ocean basins and how ocean basins form and the, the structure of ocean basins and we'll talk more about ocean basins as we continue with the study of oceanography. So this has been the lecture Plate Tectonics from the Essentials of Oceanography textbook, the 8th edition, written by Tom Garrison and Robert Ellis from Cengage Learning, of course, for your course, Introduction to Oceanography.